Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, given the, the state of the temperatures and the wildfire smoke out there, I can't think of a better way to spend the next hour than with, with SEPA and our guest speakers at this webinar. So thank you very much for sharing your, your afternoon or your morning with us. Uh, I am Rusty Haynes, a manager of research and industry strategy here at the Smart Electric Power Alliance, uh, that's SEPA, and I'll be moderating this webinar. As you probably know, today's discussion addresses the inclusive utility investment model Inclusive utility investment programs can expand access to cost-effective energy efficiency and electrification upgrades for all utility customers, including those underserved by conventional utility customer programs. Inclusive utility investment is a proven model among electric distribution cooperatives that's now attracting interest from investor-owned utilities. Today's speakers will explain how this model can benefit utilities through load growth and avoided costs how it can yield equitable and cost-saving energy upgrades for customers, and how it can provide an attractive return on the utility's investment. Next slide, please. Uh, before we dig into the discussion, a couple of quick housekeeping nuggets. Uh, first of all, all audience members will be muted with cameras off, just so you're aware. Second, please take a quick look at the control panel at the bottom of your screen, and you'll see a Q&A icon. Um, submit questions for the speakers through the Q&A tool as they arise. You're welcome to do that throughout the, the presentations. Uh, we'll address most of those later during the Q&A session. Third, this webinar will be recorded and we'll be posting a recording of the webinar to SEPA's website at sepapower.org under the Knowledge tab in approximately one week. And fourth, um, we'll issue a brief survey immediately after this webinar closes um, because we always appreciate your feedback and ideas about how we can do better with these events going forward. Next slide, please. Here is the menu of today's speakers. Uh, I've introduced myself already, Rusty Haynes from SEPA. Also with us today are Matt Flaherty and Margarita Parra from Clean Energy Works. And in addition, Kathy Davison from Rona Cooperative are join, uh, is joining us today. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a public webinar, so in case you're not familiar with SEPA, the Smart Electric Power Alliance, um, I'll provide a very quick overview of SEPA. We are a membership-based organization. We're a 501c3, so no lobbying. We have approximately 1,200 industry members, and roughly half of those are utilities. By extension, half of those are, are not utilities, of course. Uh, we have 50 staff members. We were founded in 1992 as a solar-focused uh, nonprofit and since have expanded into all forms of smart energy. Um, SEPA provides unbiased information. We focus on research, education, collaboration, and standards. Uh, we are technology agnostic with respect to carbon-free energy, and our focus is national, state, and local with a bit of international beyond that. Next slide, please. Uh, SEPA's vision is a net zero carbon energy system that's safe, affordable, reliable, resilient, and equitable. And SEPA's mission is to accelerate the transformation to a carbon-free electricity system through actionable solutions. Next slide, please. Um, today, I'm pleased to announce, um, despite my terrible uh, graphic up at the top um, with a new burst image up there, um, that we are launching the Inclusive Utility Investment Task Force so this is a project of SEPA along with our partner, uh, Clean Energy Works. Um, this is part of a broader initiative uh, with our partner organization, Clean Energy Works. I'll provide a bit more info later, but as a sneak preview regarding the task force, this, this new group will meet approximately monthly to hold group discussions of key issues related to inclusive utility investments. Uh, it will offer learning opportunities led by subject matter experts. It will offer opportunities for folks to participate in specific activities. Um, importantly, the task force is open to all stakeholders. It's public. That includes utilities, government agencies, equipment manufacturers, utility partners, other nonprofits, and so on. Um, also importantly, you do not need to be a, a SEPA member to participate, open to all. And please stay tuned for a bit more info later um, on, on how to sign up and how to participate. That's coming up after the, the presentations. Next slide, please. Uh, now we'll be hearing from Matt Flaherty and Margarita Parra, both of Queen Energy Works. A couple of quick bios, one for each. Matt Flaherty is a senior associate in the Building Decarbonization Program at Queen Energy Works. His prior professional experience spans work as an attorney, a climate change policy and programs manager, and an energy justice researcher. He also serves as an at-large city council member in Bloomington, Indiana. 
and his work at the Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute, Matt led policy and program implementation, assisting local governments in advancing climate action and community resilience. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Illinois, and a law degree and master's degree in public affairs and environmental science from Indiana University. Margarita Parra leads Clean Energy Works transportation decarbonization portfolio. Trained as a chemical engineer from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia with a master's in environmental engineering from New Zealand and a diploma in sustainable development from India, Margarita has worked for more than two decades in Latin America, China, India, and the United States to reduce local air pollution and global carbon emissions from transportation. She previously managed the low carbon transport portfolio of the Hewlett Foundation's Global Climate Initiative. Uh, welcome, Matt, and welcome, Margarita, and I'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rusty. So great to be with all of you, along with my colleague, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. I'll uh, get things started for us here. And since uh, Rusty already gave those uh, very generous introductions, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Thank you. So as Rusty noted, Clean Energy Works and SEPA are partnering to advance equitable and inclusive financial solutions in support of a clean energy future. And that's because we share a vision for a resilient carbon-free energy system that centers equity, making sure that everyone can benefit from the clean energy economy and that excluded and overburdened communities in particular are not left behind. Next slide, please. And so we have this shared vision of a reliable carbon-free future and creating that system, especially in a way that's resilient, affordable, and doesn't leave anyone behind, requires really a transformation in how we think about and manage the grid. So looking back at the last century, the grid was primarily uh, managed from the supply side. We built large generation assets that offered dispatchable and flexible energy supply to meet a largely inflexible consumer demand. But as we look to the future and a grid dominated by renewable energy, we will need management from the demand side. Widespread distributed energy resources will allow utilities, regulators, and system operators to shape energy demand to meet the variability inherent with many renewable energy resources. Next slide, please. And so with that transformation and that new grid paradigm in mind, I want to uh, shift my attention to the subject of our presentation uh, title, which highlighted inclusive utility investment as a strong tool to advance beneficial electrification virtual power plants and equity. And so beneficial electrification involves electrifying end uses to achieve benefits like increased efficiency, lower customer costs, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, increased comfort, and a more resilient and flexible grid. We can't decarbonize without beneficial electrification of virtually all end uses within the built environment. And a major benefit of doing so is the potential that managing these resources unlocks. So when a portfolio of smart DERs is actively managed in the form of a virtual power plant or VPP, utilities can harness their potential to deliver benefits to the power system, their customers, and society. A recent report from the Brattle Group, for instance, found that DPPs are a viable and highly cost-effective strategy to assure adequate resources in a decarbonized energy system. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Margarita here. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we need these clean energy solutions, these new solutions to decarbonize our economies. But we also need to ensure that those solutions are equitable, inclusive, and just. Without policy interventions, these solutions may be implemented unevenly, may benefit mostly privileged populations, and may not provide access for disadvantaged and underserved communities. Clean energy works, as Matt say, focus on equity. So we have developed an equity framework that brings four dimensions of equity distributed equity, procedural equity, recognition equity, and restorative equity. We have identified key questions that help assess or any given policy across the four dimensions. So questions like who receives the benefits, who has access, who is involved in the process, and how empowered are they? Are historical harms recognized? And who are the local experts providing insight into these historical harms? What opportunities in this clean energy economy and this transition to that economy um, enable burdened communities to thrive? What are these new opportunities? We hope that by following this framework, we achieve solutions that are equitable and just. Next one, please. We also need to understand how we can fund and finance these 
decarbonization solution. So here you can see uh, what the traditional options are that we have used. Um, traditionally, we have had taxpayer funds, red payer funds, and polluter funds. And all of them have been used um, to clean, to pay for clean energy upgrades. Um, however, some of them have limitations. So for example, funding programs. Uh, we're very lucky to live under an administration that we have IJA and IRA programs, these acts who enable a lot of resources to flow, but they're always going to be limited by the administration that is in, in, in place and by limited budgets. Utility rebates, which could be very generous and approved by commissions are a good source of, uh, of resources for our grades, but they are regressive in the sense that everybody pays in the rates and not everybody benefits from them. And polluter funds may not exist in all the states, restricting access. So there is some challenges to achieving a scale and equity with funding opportunities. And financing is another way to pay for these upgrades, but financing uh, in the form of consumer loans, on institutional loans, leases, um, are limited too, um, because they have barriers for access. So we need alternative financing models that are scalable and equitable. Next slide, please. So here we're bringing to you today this, um, this alternative and inclusive utility investments. So inclusive utility investments are a financial solution that allows utilities to invest in all cost-effective clean energy upgrades at the site and recovers this cost through a site-specific tariff charge on the customer's utility bill that is less than estimated cost savings from the upgrades. In other words, it's a different cost recovery mechanism that is enabled by the savings. Uh, it's another tool in the toolkit. And it's important to know that this is tied to a meter, making a very big difference to traditional financing or loans. Next slide, please. So we know how this new tool in the toolkit, uh, inclusive utility investments, can help overcome many of the challenges that we know in the previous slides. Um, inclusive utility investments can, with good policy design, address more barriers to, an advancing, to advancing this inclusive clean energy transition and avoid consumer barriers or try and overcome consumer barriers, but also systemic barriers. Uh, for example, they can contribute to reduce the high upfront cost uh, that we experience with clean energy upgrades. Uh, we can eliminate these credit, credit worthiness requirements on the loan side. Uh, we can help on this landlord tenant split incentive that sometimes we have with energy efficiency measures. And on the systemic level, we can leverage public funds. We know public funds as generous as they are, they are limited. And with inclusive utility investments, we can leverage them and get to scale. And at the same time, as we say, with good program design, we can ensure that um, inclusion and equity concerns are addressed. Back to you, Matt. Next slide. Thank you. And so the data and field experience with inclusive utility investment programs, especially regarding consumer protections and overcoming some of those barriers to accessing clean energy upgrades that Margarita just highlighted, this has all led the EPA to highlight this policy design as an important model to help deliver benefits to underserved and overburdened communities. And so in this quote, EPA Administrator Michael Regan is praising the pay as you save system, which is a particular inclusive utility investment policy design developed by the Energy Efficiency Institute that has proven especially effective at equitably expanding access to energy efficiency upgrades. Next slide, please. And this support from EPA has also led to the development of a new resource hub for inclusive utility investment. It was launched last year in conjunction with uh, the launch of Energy Star's Home Upgrade Program. And so this re resource hub covers the details of program design, it highlights best practices and key consumer protections, and houses a repository of information on active inclusive utility investment programs. Next slide, please. I also want to take a moment here to clarify some terminology, as there are some older terms in use in the field that can be a source of confusion. So specifically, the term on-bill financing was formerly used to describe several distinct policy designs, including utility and third-party loan programs, where loan payments were captured as part of a, utility, a customer's utility bill. And sometimes inclusive utility investment programs have been lumped into this on-bill financing category as well but the policy design is, is actually not consumer financing at all. Uh, Margarita noted in the prior slides that inclusive utility investment is a non-debt-based financial tool that allows utility capital investment in a project based on the cost-saving potential of the project and the site, not any customer financial characteristics. 
And so what I've highlighted here in the slide comes from EPA's Clean Energy Financing Toolkit for Decision Makers, where importantly, they move away from ambiguous terminology, uh, specifically on-bill financing, which can mean different things to different people, and more aptly name on-bill loan programs as one design for loans and list inclusive utility investments as a different high-level policy category. Uh, sometimes agencies or regulators still include the term tariff on bill in conjunction with inclusive utility investment, and that's a reference to the tariff that governs the terms of the utilities site specific cost recovery. So they're listed together here on the EPA site. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm back. Um, this is the map of the adoption of inclusive utility investment. So you can see a, a lot happening here. and We're very happy. but. This is why we're doing this webinar because we want to color this map. And this is the, one of the first steps to do that. Join the task force. Um, so what you can see here is that uh, we have some um, grays of blue and some yellow um, states. Um, the dark blue is four states that have approved inclusive utility programs. Uh, the royal blue, I believe, the not so dark, but no clear, no clear blue are states where they have some formal proceedings at the way to adopt inclusive utility investments. The light blue are when we have states that are uh, doing some formal due diligence uh, in order to um, approve these programs um, and propose them. And in the uh, beige color or yellow color, we have uh, states who are doing informal due diligence uh, to get those programs underway. Um, so we have a lot of states with no activity. Uh, on the other hand, we see some dots. So the orange dots are the rural cops and the munis who have undertaken these programs and implemented them. And um, the blue dots are the investor-owned utilities. So some high-level uh, learnings from this map, as you can see, a lot of activity in the middle of the country, which is great to see in the Midwest and the Southeast. Uh, we also see that uh, there's more uh, orange dots than blue dots. It's not a competition, but we can see that the rural cops are leading the way. and. Uh, as soon as uh, the IOUs are going to catch up. So we need to turn more color into this map. So next slide, I'm going to tell you how we do that. Next slide, please. Great, so we have seen, uh, based on the experience, some pathways to adoption. Um, this is based on our experience, what we have observed. So one path that we see uh, is that when the utility takes the lead, and we have seen in the case the Tucson um, Electric Power and DT in Michigan, which proposed and implemented programs, of course, with commission approval. Um, another part that we have seen is by legislative mandate. And one example here that is very close to us is in Illinois, where the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, CJA, uh, led to the Equitable Energy Upgrade Program that directed all the utilities to use inclusive utility investments. And also we have a case in Virginia. Another pathway is through commission-led processes. And in this case, we had the example of California, which is very recently, I think last month, uh, the PUC directed all the uh, investor-owned utilities to work with one of their community choice aggregators, the Silicon Valley Community en Clean Energy, um, to collaborate to present a joint inclusive utility investment proposal. Um, there is also a path through state um, agencies, through the energy state agencies, such as in Vermont, and the last pathway that we've seen for adoption is when we've seen um, the leadership from uh, environmental, environmental justice groups, community groups, consumer groups to really advocate for these programs. And we can cite the, the case in North Carolina where groups like the North Carolina Justice Center, the North Carolina Sustainable Energy and others have make uh, sure that um, Duke, the, the utility, filed for inclusive utility investment programs for energy efficiency last year. And we also have uh, Roanoke here from North Carolina. So we see there's a lot of leadership in that state. So there are a few pathways for adoption and we can uh, come up with others. They are all synergistic. Um, next slide, and back to you, Matt. So besides the potential for fiscal sustainability, one of the reasons why inclusive utility investment has such high potential to scale beneficial electrification is the fact that it can deliver a win-win for electric utilities and customers. So we've highlighted some benefits here. Utilities can drive electric load growth and capital investment while earning their regulated rate of return. And by investing directly in DERs, utilities are also then well positioned to coordinate and benefit from DER management in a virtual power plant, a key to the utility model of the future. And of course, serving customers is at the core of the utility's interest and the interests of the regulated energy system more broadly. For customers, we've talked about increased access and inclusion that comes from reducing upfront cost and other barriers. Uh, program implementation 
also vastly simplifies the process of beneficial electrification for customers who no longer need, for instance, to judge what upgrades might be a fiscally prudent choice uh, or determine what a good price from a contractor is or worry about the quality of installation. So home upgrades uh, lead to a more comfortable home and also less bill volatility. That's especially true during very cold and very hot months, uh, like much of the country is experiencing right now, in fact. And another major benefit is that once a utility uh, fully recovers its costs, ownership of the upgrades themselves transfers to the customer. Next slide, please. And so as a policy design, inclusive utility investments can be applied in a variety of contexts. And Margarita, Margarita and I are going to cover some of these. Um, and first I'll start with the kind of conventional application, which is programs focused on residential building upgrades, including weatherization, energy efficiency, and heat pumps. And as I noted before, the predominant policy design in this area in particular has been the pay as you save system, which requires key essential elements that support program success and protect consumers. Next slide, please. So the customer experience is one important aspect of program implementation that is part of what drives success. When customers have uh, upgrade offers with no upfront costs, programs have been able to deliver up to 80 to 90% conversion rates on these offers. And that's not only because the strictly economic value proposition, but also because programs create this streamlined turnkey process for the customer. They simply need to request an energy audit and the program and operator, program operator and contractors do the rest. Customers still get to choose their contractor from an approved uh, set and installation quality is verified and upgrade performance backed up by the utility. Next slide, please. A hallmark of inclusive utility investment policies are consumer protections some of which I've touched on. And so these include a requirement for estimated annual cost savings that exceed the tariff charge based on site-specific energy audit, which is then further calibrated by historic billing data. Quality assurance of upgrades, extended equipment warranties, obligations to repair, no-fault equipment failures are other key protections. And I've also highlighted here a few key challenges uh, for reaching some customers. So the graphic on the previous page noted that when functioning optimally, the cost of the clean energy upgrades are fully covered by the cost of the savings. That is, there's no upfront cost. But of course, not every beneficial electrification upgrade can be fully supported by cost savings alone. And in those situations, there is an upfront co-payment that can undermine program success. And so additional incentives like rebates through the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, or targeted public subsidy to support lower income customers in particular can ensure further uh, access and advancing equity. Also, a note here that lower income housing stock, especially, uh, often has structural deficiencies uh, or health and safety challenges that really need to be repaired or addressed before beneficial electrification to proceed, uh, highlighting the need for braiding uh, policies and programs and having a collaborative community approach to uh, um, making sure that everybody uh, can, can share in our decarbonized climate econ or, uh, energy economy. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Margarita. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, so let's talk briefly before we um, let Katya speak more about their experience in Roanoke about other emerging applications. Uh, next one, please. One, close, one that is very close to my heart because I've been living in is the application of inclusive utility investments on transportation electrification. So all that we talked about uh, in terms of how you use inclusive utility investments can be applied to EV infrastructure and EV batteries. Uh, so the onboard batteries of electric vehicles. Um, and this is a great incentive to reduce the upfront cost, which in electric vehicles could be significant, three or four times more in cases where we compare an electric bus to an alternative bus. So really here that those are very fundamental, inclusive utility investments to break that barrier. Um, important thing to note is that um, in order to realize those savings that Matt was just mentioned uh, with electric vehicles, we really start our application with high mileage vehicles. The more mileage your vehicle, for example, a transit bus, uh, the more the, the savings. That's why the application is a bit more cost effective. Next one. And the right spot on this is DTE in Michigan. So DTE uh, got the approval last year by the Michigan Public Service Commission to uh, implement a pilot. Uh, it was originally for 2 million for batteries on board transit buses. Uh, so DTE will uh, invest uh, on the batteries and the rest of the bus will be covered by uh, grant funding from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, this proposal was so well received that the commissioners requested to expand it. And in a filing case this year, 
uh, DTE requested to expand it for another 3 million to include school buses, electric school buses, but also another commercial fleet uh, and refuse trucks. Next one. And the last um, application um, that we want to mention is solar. And this is very important because now with the IRI incentives and the new tax credits and the option of direct payment, uh, we can see that this, this may become more attractive. So the application of solar, of course, um, uh, has many benefits. Is the, the future that we see, the renewable uh, clean energy future that Matt described, and an inclusive utility investment of solar rooftops and uh, energy storage really makes this very attractive. And there is no an implementation yet, it's been modeled, but the good news is that uh, in Illinois, um, the measures that have been discussed as part of the energy uh, equitable energy upgrade program include solar. So we may see an application develop soon. So this is it for us in terms of the overall presentation. So thank you for your attention and we really look forward to the Q&A. Back to you, Rusty. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Margarita. Um, and now we'll hear from Kathy Davison uh, of Roto Cooperative. And Kathy, uh, fortunately, has the experience of, of running one of these programs that, that Matt and Margarita have just described. So quick overview of Kathy uh, and, and her work. Um, Kathy has a diverse background in executive management, economic development, finance, and human resources, including 20 plus years in local and regional government prior to retiring to start a second career with Roanoke Cooperative in 2018. She currently serves as Roanoke's CFO after serving as its VP of Finance and Accounting and VP of Corporate Services. Kathy oversees the accounting department, financial operations for Roanoke Cooperative and its subsidiaries, along with leading Roanoke's Office of Strategy Management. She holds a BA in Political Science and Liberal Arts from Anderson University and MA from the University of Denver in Organizational Leadership and Human Resources Administration and an MPA in Finance and Budgeting from Norwich University. Uh, Kathy, please go ahead. Thank you, Rusty, and thank you, Margarita and Matthew, for laying the groundwork on inclusive utility investment. Next slide. So, as you as you've already heard, Roanoke um, about the pays model, but Roanoke utilizes the pays model. And why do we uh, utilize the pays model? The program reaches out to all types of customers and our members from residential, commercial, rental, as well as our agricultural members. And we have more customers say yes to more measures than any other type of program. And our programs can be designed for a broad spectrum of upgrades and targeted measure packages, as we've heard. Um, and then we also think it's the most affordable way to achieve energy efficiency and climate change goals as we look at providing service to our member owners without the, the bank financing and the credit checks. Next slide. And so when we look at our upgrade to save program, getting to yes, as we all know, sometimes people will think, well, this is too good to be um, true. So what does our Upgrade to Save program mean to our member owners? And Upgrade to Save is our term for the inclusive utility investment. So it eliminates the barriers that keep um, customers from purchasing efficient efficiency upgrades that save them money. And when we start looking at that, it allows the members to purchase um, these measures with no upfront cost. And when we have our member owners that may have a copay or additional expenses, we actually have an opportunity with some of our philanthropic partners to pay down those expenses. And there's no debt obligation, no ch credit checks, no liens, and a guarantee that their monthly charge is lower than their estimated savings. And this assures that they will only pay while they remain at the location, a promise that is, has failed other organizations, but um, if the failed measures were, will be repaid or the payment will obligation will end. 
And then when we also look at the Upgrade to Save program, it aligns payment responsibility for upgrades to the meter location, not the owner of the property or not the individual customer. So we can have a rental property and we do have a large, about 80% of our residential properties are rental. And what we do is we have an agreement that both the property owner and the member owner or the renter will sign. And then we also look at the monthly charge tariff and it's always lower than the estimated um, savings from the installed measures. And what does this mean? The charge remains on the bill for that location until the costs are recovered. And this means the tenant or anyone who is um, uncertain about the duration of their occupancy can purchase the Upgrade to Save program measures and be assured that they will receive the same savings. And then, as I mentioned, the philanthropic funds are available for health and safety upgrades, as well as copay assistance to pay down those inflation increased uh, energy efficient upgrades. And then it's a good investment. Our third party capital pays for the cost of the, the program installations. And we have been very blessed to be a part of the USDA ECLIP program as, as well as the Rural Utility Services Energy, um, Rural Energy Savings Program. And this finances the upgrades at very little or low low cost to the cooperative as well as to the participants. Next slide. So how does the program work? Our, our participants are identified and enrolled through high usage alerts, high bill complaints, and pledge assistance or public assistance that a member owner receives to pay their electric bill. But not only that, the participant is able to enroll in multiple ways. They can fill out uh, on the website a letter of interest or application of interest. They can come in and see our member services rep and, and fill out the application face-to-face, -face, or they could even do it over the phone. And it's a, an easy way for our members to, to be a part or become a part of the program. Next slide. So how does the program, how does the program work? When we look at a member owner that enrolls in the program, we have an energy service technician that will come out and um, do an energy audit. And with that, the you'll see as the, the, um, the graphic shows that we have an energy audit that provides different areas. is eligible for, for upgrades. It also identifies health and safety issues. If, next slide. And then if there is health and safety issues, we do have an opportunity to utilize um, philanthropic funds to pay for for those health and safety issues. And when we when we look at those health and safety issues, um, we're we're able, as I mentioned, we're able to use philanthropic funds that we have available to pay for those. And then next slide. When we look at our energy savings analysis, it's based on the energy audit and the energy savings analysis that it's done. 
And then on average, we'd like to see 20 to 25% savings on that energy bill. And keep in mind, as Matt and Margarita had mentioned, it's sometimes not just the electric bill, it's you know a gas bill or other forms of energy that the home is using. And then with that, the easy plan is created with PAYS and we have a, a program um, operator that does that for us, and that's E-Utility out of Little Rock, Arkansas. And going further, just to give you an update, next slide, uh, looking at how our program works and our program caps, based on um, the, the analysis as well as our, our inflation and cost of doing business as well as equipment from labor, we've seen an increase in our program cap. So we have a cap on health and safety issues that increased this year to $9,000, uh, a cap on weatherization at 2,500. And then our retrofits, which is generally an HVAC unit with um, duct work at $12,000. And of course, what is not included in the standard scope of work is um, any copay assistance because of the philanthropic funds that we do have available to us. We are able to provide up to $5,000 on copay assistance. And then um, we'd like to see a cap on the tariffs as, as it um, relates to retrofits, $12,000. Next slide. So once, once we have the easy plan and the analysis done, our staff will sit down with the member owner who may or may not be the property owner. And we also look at that if there is a copay on the easy plan to achieve the um, energy savings, the, this opportunity will be reviewed with the member owner, but their eligibility to receive philanthropic assistance will, will be reviewed. And if they meet the criteria as previously mentioned, then, then they'll have copay assistance applied to their easy plan. And generally, our member owner and property owner signs the easy plan for 10 years, and we can extend that for up to 12 years. And then staff assigns the work to a local contractor to perform the work. And it's truly an exciting opportunity. And some of this, as I mentioned, the energy savings comes from multiple, it could come from multiple um, areas and includes electricity or in our area, we have food, um, fuel, oil, and as well as gas. Next slide. So as we, as we have an energy service technician who happens to be certified as an HVAC um, technician, it's interesting that he was able to get his certification because of a workforce development grant we received from our local workforce development board. And with his certification, he is able to go out and conduct a quality assurance review of, of the work. He creates a punch list and um, those the items that do not pass the quality assurance inspection. And that list, if there is one, is given to the contractor and the contractor finishes those punch list items. And it's pretty standard it, as you would with any building project. And then the energy services technician signs off on the finalized project and the easy plan and tariff is created and the contractor sends us the invoice to Rona for payment. So next slide. So once the invoice comes in, a tariff and contract is created on the member owner account. And the notice, we, we recognized early on that we had a challenge and that was because of the high rental um, population. 
and rental housing stock that we had um, fluctuation in people moving in and out of our service territory or um, homes being sold. So we started filing a notice of tariff with our county register of deeds. It's not a lien, it's just a notice of a commitment on the electric bill. And then once all of that is done, Roanoke submits a reimbursement request for the contract work to USDA, currently USDA's Rural Energy Savings Program. And generally we receive our, our um, funds within five business days. Next slide. So managing our program risk. As we looked at the needs within our service territory and the, the aging housing stock, we started raising funds with the philanthropic community. And our, our, um, our co-op has raised more than $1.5 million since 2018 to assist with paying down energy upgrade expenses, uh, some of our members would not be eligible for our upgrade to save or the inclusive utility investment program because of the health and safety issues. And the philanthropic funds pay for those health and safety upgrades. And we've also worked with um, the North Carolina Energy Resource Center to cover three out of the five defaulted tariffs that we've had. And then, as I mentioned, since 2021, we filed a notice of tariff for every project that we have entered into a tariff. And this really protects Roanoke. It also protects the member owner and the property owner when the property is sold. And then as, as I, I mentioned that the property owners, if it's a rental property, the property owners are required to sign the program offer, not just the renter, because they don't have an obligation to that home. And it truly is an investment in that home. And this protects Roanoke, and it also protects the property owner and the future owners should the renter move out and the property is sold. So next slide. Talking about some of our results, we've, we've been excited to be in the um, inclusive utility investment business since 2015. And since that time, we've had over 1,200 member owners participate in our program. And that may not, may not seem like a, a, a great deal, but it's 10% of our membership. And as of the end of June, that is an investment of over $6 million into our member owners' homes, um, businesses, agriculture facilities. And it's exciting to see that we have 30 additional participants that are ready for the program. And we are finalizing uh, the schedule with our contractors to, to move forward with that work. And then the other thing that's exciting about our program, because of how inclusive it is, and there we have a very low default rate at 1%, at and it's actually less than 1%. As you saw, we, as I previously mentioned, that we have five contracts out of the 1,273 participants in the program, we've only had five that have defaulted on their contract. And we're very proud of the fact that we've worked with our member owners and the property owners to keep that default rate low and to continue offering exceptional services. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Rusty and I I'm open to any questions that you may have on Roanoke Cooperatives program. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kathy. It's great not only to have um, two representatives from Queen Energy Works as subject matter experts, but also um, to have Kathy here who's who's been helping run one of these programs and has been in the trenches since 2015 and certainly provides some, some unique perspectives, um, which she just shared with us. Uh, reminder to uh, please enter any questions you might have into the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. 
and we'll be keeping an eye on those um, as, as they roll in. Uh, one question that I think is probably uh, better for Matt and Margarita at Clean Energy Works. Um, what are, uh, and Kathy addressed this in her presentation, but just in a nutshell, what, what's the spectrum of opportunities for utilities to, to finance uh, inclusive utility investment programs? Um, I assume it's different for investor in utilities versus uh, electric distribution cooperatives such as Roanoke. I'm happy to handle that one, thanks. Uh, so yeah, as far as sources of capital, uh, most, I mean, technically any any um, electric cooperative could borrow from any normal borrowing source. Uh, so that might include uh, dedicated uh, banks for uh, cooperatives like CFC or CoBank, but more typically uh, they access uh, specific programs through the Rural Utility Service, like the Rural Energy Savings Program or the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Loan Program, which offer uh, even more attractive terms like 0% loans for um cooperative utilities to create energy efficiency programs like this. So that's been kind of the predominant source for electric cooperatives. Uh, the in, in the municipal space, municipal bonds are an option for municipal utilities. And with investor-owned utilities, uh, similarly, they, they might access their normal utility capital markets. Um, but that's more emergent. The, the IOU programs are still sort of um, being developed. And there are options there, too, potentially for uh, leveraging uh, public dollars, green banks to help finance uh, programs or otherwise provide supports through reserve funds uh, to protect uh, against utility risk or customer risk, that sort of thing. Thanks, Matt. Um, let's see, a uh, question rolled in. This is probably for Kathy. Um, wondering how Roanoke has communicated the program to rental property owners and also to tenor, uh, tenant residents. How have you marketed the, the program basically. And maybe a, a question to add on to that is, are you working with any on the ground organizations outside of the utility, nonprofits, community organizations, churches, et cetera, to, to get the word out about your program? Absolutely. We, we communicate through our, <laughs> excuse me, through the realtors in our area, as well as the property owners. Also, if it's a rental property that, um, someone comes in and is renting the property, we communicate the plan with them, the opportunity if the home is not already a part of the program. And when we look at our local partners, our Department of Social Services and our nonprofit social, social agencies that provide pledges for member owners for their um, electric bills, we work with them to publicize the program. And then another, another opportunity that we have is we have a, a Faith Energy Fellow out of um, working with the Energy Center and or Clean Energy Center. And she is promoting the program to our faith-based community. And it's really exciting to see uh, member owners that go to church or haven't heard about the program their excitement because it's a different way of, of communicating the program and getting the message out. Um, of course, we have the information on our website and uh, bill inserts that we include that information as well. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, more questions rolling in. Another one for you. And this is of the roughly 1,300 participants in, in Roanoke's current program. Um, how many of those properties have been bought and sold since since inception? And can you say more about what the experience has been like of, of selling a property that is participating in, in the program? I could not give you the actual number of how many of those have have sold since the the prop or since the program has started, but I will let you know our experience. A couple of the defaults that we've had. Um, out of the five that we've had since 2015 were properties that were sold. And that's why we started filing the notice of default. What we've really what we really noticed is having education and providing information to realtors as well as our register of deeds and the title search companies that when they're aware of the program or the opportunity that there may be a program and a tariff on, on the bill, that there's more awareness and the 
the transfer of that commitment or that tariff to the new account is seamless. Got it. Thank you, Kathy. And another quick question for you, if you know it off the top of your head. Um, if not, we can get back to the uh, the gentleman who asked. Um, do you know what percentage of of customers in your service territory, your members, generally qualify for upgrade to save? And let's let's take residential customers. Absolutely, members. And usually, what happens is about fifty percent of our member owners at the, the initial assessment qualify for upgrade to save. And the reason it, it's 50%, it's because that other 30%, 30 to 40% have health and safety issues in their homes. So once the health and safety issues are mitigated, then um, 80 to 90% of our member owners are qualified for upgrade to save. Thanks, Kathy. This this is a question that's probably better for uh, Matt and Margarita. Um, just considering the map that you showed earlier, uh, and and you noted that many of the uh, dots on the map are electric cooperatives, such as Rona Cooperative. Um, why do you think uh, investor and utilities haven't pursued this as voraciously as you might expect? I can get this started, Matt. You compliment if I'm wrong uh, <laughs> what I'm missing. Um, I think the agility that rural uh, cooperatives have is, is greater because, of course, in some cases, they do not require the commission approval. Normally, uh, um, the process for an investor-owned utility from the beginning to the proposed to the approval could take between one and a half years to two years, uh, whereas for a rural cop, um, that will take maybe six months to get their board approved. Uh, or if they need some other uh, approvals. Um, but all of them, and, and we face this um, barrier of lack of information and awareness. So this is why I'm so happy we're doing this because we still need to really disseminate more the information about the advantages of, of this new uh, tool um, as a new utility investments. And some other barriers that we'll see is how we, um, uh, to ensure more adoption is how we balance the interest of all the stakeholders. Uh, sometimes um, increased utility investments are perceived to compete with other programs. Um, there is, of course, the, this, the issue of the rate of return for utilities. And all of that could be, of course, resolved and addressed uh, on workshop processes and proceedings uh, with the commissions. Uh, so that takes some time. But we hope that with the information that has been um, you know, coming up, the task force, we will see more investor on utilities taking the lead too. Thanks, Margarita. Um, let's see, we'll do one more question uh, and then we'll wrap up afterward. Um, for, for utilities who are interested in exploring this model further, uh, what do you recommend as the next best steps to do so? Matt, I'll let you take that one. Sure. Well, you could certainly join the task force. Uh, we've got some, some dedicated work coming up to make sure that we're sharing knowledge across uh, folks with active programs. So what are the lessons learned? How can we benefit? That's uh, part of our role as, as a, a nonprofit organization that uh, works to advance and better understand the solution as well is really getting in the weeds on data tracking and understanding what is performance like, what are barriers, how can we improve those? So uh, just connecting through the task force or other um, utilities with existing programs is a great start. Also, uh, if you are a regulated utility, get in touch with your commissioner or staff about how this can meet broader goals that your state might have, that your utility might have. Uh, again, the EPA Resource Hub is a terrific uh, first landing place uh, to go. Uh, there's a lot of information on there about best practices, about existing programs, uh, case studies, uh, for instance. Um, you know, uh, there was a question that I answered uh, textually in the in the chat about uh, no cost offers and, and equity around folks who have energy burden needs to be addressed as well. And I'll just highlight that, you know, no cost offer, uh, offers or upgrades are always uh, the first best option for folks who are income qualified for those. And there's a case study about Midwest Cooperative in Kansas uh, that has had a, a success uh, working with the state's weatherization assistance program to uh, build on the weatherization and retrofits that that uh, folks have had through that program at no cost to add HVAC, which wasn't eligible through that program and complement one another. So that case study, for instance, is also on that EPA resource hub. Uh, so those are some, some good options. Also, of course, getting in touch with your stakeholders. So community groups, environmental justice groups, uh, clean energy advocates and others uh, that you work with. 
Thanks, Matt. That's uh, a lot of a lot of great advice. Um, and as Matt mentioned, we'll certainly be covering more of these kinds of questions and, and considerations and sharing resources in, in our new task force. Speaking of which, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few minutes left before wrapping up here. Um, yes, you get to see my lame graphic art again. Um, we are launching today SEPA's Inclusive Utility Investment Task Force, and this is open to everybody as a reminder. Um, please do join if you'd like. Uh, here's a quick overview of our objectives and activities. Next slide, please. Um, so as for objectives, we, we plan to raise awareness of the inclusive utility investment model among utilities and other industry stakeholders. Uh, we'll provide a forum for utilities and stakeholders to discuss opportunities, issues, barriers, program development, results, and lessons learned. We will create new resources to enhance industry knowledge of the model and to facilitate program development. And we will determine what additional kinds of assistance can help utilities move forward if they choose to do so with program development. Uh, next slide, please. Here are some examples of the activities that the task force will pursue. Uh, we'll hold approximately monthly discussions, group discussions of higher priority questions and, and topics led by subject matter, subject matter experts. Uh, we will share results and lessons learned from existing inclusive utility investment programs, such as Roanoke's. Uh, we'll create and maintain a resource library of useful publications. As Matt mentioned, EPA already has a lot of great content on its site, so certainly we'll fold a lot of that into what we have in mind. Uh, we will develop and publish case studies of successful programs and, and blog posts as well. And then we will also encourage mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer learning among uh, folks who are interested, particularly utilities. Um, let's see, next slide, please. Our two co-chairs will be Kathy Davison. Uh, that name might sound familiar. Of course, Kathy was our guest speaker, one of our three guest speakers today. Uh, again, Kathy is the CFO of Roanoke Cooperative in North Carolina. And our other task force co-chair will be Nick Bafalukas uh, of ComEd, which if you're not familiar with ComEd is the major investor in utility that serves the Chicago area. Uh, Nick is director of customer solutions for ComEd. So we're very pleased and excited to be working with Kathy and Nick going forward on task force activities. Uh, next slide, please. How to get involved. Um, reminder, this is open to everybody, not just SEPA members, not utilities only, but all industry stakeholders. Uh, sign up to stay informed of the task forces, developments, activities, and opportunities. There's a URL at the bottom of the screen, and I challenge you to uh, transcribe that before we move on to the next slide. <laughs> we will send this information out afterward, though, so it will be in the follow-up survey should you choose to join. Simply uh, sign up the form, and you can stay abreast of the events and opportunities. Um, once you are, are following the, the task force's activities, you're welcome to participate in discussions and other types of activities, uh, including generating the products I mentioned earlier and sharing your experiences with peers and vice versa, including mentoring. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my contact information. Again, Rusty Haynes at SEPA. You're welcome to email me if you have specific questions about the task force or um, participation in the task force. Uh, next slide, please. And I mentioned that right after this webinar ends, thank you very much for attending. You will all receive a survey to let us know how we're doing. And certainly we appreciate as always, your feedback to help us improve these events going forward. Uh, forward. Thanks in, event, in advance for, for taking a minute to help us out and improve these events. Uh, lastly, on behalf of SIPA and our three guest speakers, Matt and Margarita and Kathy, thanks very much for joining us and we'll look forward to your participation in task force activities. Thanks very much and have a good afternoon or rest of your morning. <laughs>